Worried about your home's furnace or AC? Not anymore. Legacy Heating and Air wants to make it easy for you to stay comfortable year-round. Right now, when you buy a new heating and cooling system from Legacy, we'll give you the complete package worry-free. Get a free smart thermostat, a free duct cleaning, flexible financing, and free maintenance for up to 12 years. This deal won't last long. Call your Legacy Pro today or schedule online at LegacyHeatingAndAirInc.com. A Cook Family Business. Welcome to Football Never Sleeps, the aspiring to be viral Notre Dame football show that runs right through the bowl season and into the off season. I'm Eric Hansen. He's Tyler James. Legacy Heating and Air are the people that bring you Football Never Sleeps every week, and we love them. And I do think they sleep, but not if your furnace is broken and they'll come and help you. Um, and we're here to help you with Sun Bowl knowledge, with offensive coordinator knowledge, with recruiting knowledge. We've got all kinds of things to talk about tonight. We'll also take your questions in the comments section. I'm not really good at describing that part of it and all the other things that we require or beg you to do. So I'm going to hand it over to Tyler to handle that part of it. Yeah, we appreciate everyone joining us here on a special night. Obviously, uh, I don't think many people wanted to spend their Christmas evenings with us. So we moved <laughs> football sleep to Tuesday night. Um, I know I had a great Christmas. I hope everyone else did as well. Um, make sure you're subscribed to us here on the channel. Hit the bell for reminders, and uh, that'll let you know when we have content coming um, so you don't miss uh, Football Never Sleeps when it changes days. Um, and then make sure you hit the like button to help support the show. Um, you can ask questions throughout the show. As Eric mentioned, make sure that you've clicked through to either the YouTube app or the YouTube website. Um, you won't be able to submit questions if you're watching us embedded somewhere whether it's on insideindiesports.com or on social media. Um, so make sure you click through. If you're on a desktop version of YouTube, whether it's the website or the app, the chat box should be to the right-hand side. If you're on a mobile version, it should be below our talking heads. And we hope you consider taking advantage of our 30-day free trial that we've been offering to our YouTube audience of insideindiesports.com. If you use the promo code NDYT, when you sign up, you get free access to our premium analysis and recruiting coverage and special access to us over on the Insider Lounge, where we reported last Monday Mike Dembrock's willingness to listen to Notre Dame, thanks to Eric, and eventually broke the news of him agreeing to become Notre Dame's offensive coordinator. So there's a link to sign up for that in the video description. Um, so if you are not subscribed to us at InsideIndieSports.com, I highly suggest you give that some consideration. Okay, well, let's get rolling here. Ever since the end of the season, the Irish have been 9-3 and three and ranked 16th in the final college football poll playoff top 25, and they're in El Paso, Texas already. Tyler James will be headed there very soon for December 29th. Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl matchup with non number 19 Oregon State, a team that's 8-4, and four, and both of them have diluted roster, so those haven't stayed frozen in time. I think we're pretty close to what the mm -hmm. rosters and the depth charts will be. Um, but we're going to move ahead first before we start talking about some of the Sun Bowl notes from today and talk about the Mike Denbrock news. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, Inside Indy Sports broke the story on Friday morning. The 59-year-old LSU offensive coordinator replaces Jared Parker, who was named head coach at Troy earlier last week. It'll be Denbrock's third tour of duty at Notre Dame. The first time he coached tackles and tight ends slash offensive line in 2002 to 2004. And then he served in a variety of roles from 2010 to 2016 under Brian Kelly. That includes tight ends coach, wide receivers coach, offensive coordinator, offensive play caller slash associate head coach. I think the biggest misnomer about Mike Denbrock and his last exit from Notre Dame, he kind of gets lumped in with the coaches that were purged during and after the 2016 season. He was able to stay on as associate head coach, wide receivers coach. He would not have called the plays in 2017. He decided to go to Cincinnati and bet on himself, and that turned out to be a great move. He did a great job at Cincinnati, ended up reuniting with Brian Kelly, 
at LSU for a couple of years. They had the number one offense in both scoring and total yards this season. And now he'll be coming to Notre Dame, and that should become official very soon. He has a history with Marcus Freeman, with Gino Gadulli, Notre Dame's current quarterbacks coach, with new wide receivers coach Mike Brown, and cornerbacks coach Mike Mickens. So, Tyler, let's start here. What is there to like about this hiring of Mike Denbrock? Yeah, I think first the familiarity with Notre Dame and the coaching staff with Marcus Freeman, Gino Gadulli, Mike Brown, less so Mike Mickens, but it doesn't hurt to know some other guys on staff. Um, but I think that should allow him to hit the ground running um, with a third third offensive coordinator for Notre Dame in three seasons. That feels really important to me that you could go into the – Okay, Tyler is frozen up, so um, we're going to just give it a second here to correct yeah. itself. Are Hello? you back? Yeah, we you froze up there. I'm, I'm during sorry. During that incredible answer. <laughs> um, you had talked about the continuity being so important or the knowledge of Notre Dame being so important with three offensive coordinators in three years, and that's kind of where we lost you. Yeah, and so I, to me, I think it's just important to be able to hit the ground running with that and, and for Notre Dame to keep building um, and not have uh, a situation where uh, you're, you're sort of starting over and revamping, especially once again, we're looking at a, a one-year rental at quarterback with Riley Leonard. You want Riley Leonard um, to be able to get the most out of this experience, you to get the most out of Riley Leonard um, coming to Notre Dame. So I think someone like Mike Dembrock with his experience, um, one, getting the most out of – someone like Jaden Daniels, who was in a similar situation. Now, obviously, it took Jaden Daniels a little bit more time. It was Jaden Daniels' second year where he really peaked. Um, so can Mike Denbrock do that in year one versus year two um, with Riley Leonard? Um, so I, I think that that is an important part of the Mike Denbrock edition. And I think just his experience in general, the, the, the value that he brings and someone that has coached all over the field um, in college football, um, he's seen just about everything – there is to see in college football. So he's, he, he seems to me like the experienced leader of an offense that, that Marcus Freeman really needs. Um, and so that's why everything seemed to make sense. And I think that's why Notre Dame sort of approached this is like, let's see if we can get Mike Denbrock first and then figure out what's left after that. Yeah. I, I think it checks so many boxes. I don't think there's anything, any such thing as a guaranteed hire, but I think this is one that, makes you feel really good about what Notre Dame did in its commitment to go out and open up the checkbook and get the guy that was presiding over the number one offense in the country, a guy that's worked with dual threat quarterbacks before. As Tyler mentioned, he's coached all over the offense. He's also been a defensive coordinator at the college level, uh, knows Notre Dame inside and out, loves Notre Dame inside and out. Um, so yeah, I think that it is going to be a very good thing for Notre Dame to have Mike Denbrock back at Notre Dame. Uh, that was certainly would have been my first choice among the people that were available. And even among the people that weren't available, I would have Ryan Grubb at Washington, Mike Denbrock at LSU would have been the two first names that I would have thought of regardless of avail availability, fit, salary requirements, those would be the two guys that I would have thought of. So I think this is a big win for Notre Dame. So Tyler, the, the other thing that to me that's kind of interesting, we, we do know that because of all this familiarity with Denbrock and the staff and in Notre Dame, that it's going to smooth out the transition. But do you think Notre Dame will feel the impact immediately of Denbrock's presence in 2024? Okay, Tyler's either, either in deep in thought or we're having um, some more issues with Wi-Fi that, uh, okay, he must have paid the bill. I saw his head move. So, I'm sorry, I'm you, sorry guys. I didn't, I, didn't I, I lost you there midway through. Okay, so um, 
do you think will feel Mike Denbrock's impact immediately in 2024? Or is this going to take a little while to ramp up? I mean, I think the the his familiarity, like I was saying, I think that allows for it to be a situation where his impact can be felt. I mean, I don't know that any of us can tell the future and know how well it works, but I I, th- I think I like the ingredients that should allow for that. The the only downside I see most specifically is a, a an uncertain offensive line that I have some concerns about their ability to play at a high level with so such little experience coming back from from this past season. Um, but if they can get that figured out, and certainly we know I mean, we've talked about wide receiver problems all season, you think we there's hope that the the receiver position will be better next year if that can't get figured out. I mean, Jane Daniels was great, but he had some great receivers too, and so that makes yeah. an offense work a lot better. Um, so those two position groups, I think, are the bigger concern. But in terms of Mike Dembrock's ability to make it happen, I think everything's there that would lead him to do that. It's just like obviously the personnel still matters, um, and so if, if they can get that personnel to develop and, and be where it needs to be going into next season, then I think – it can be felt immediately. What do you think? I, I agree. I, I don't know that, again, at LSU, they were in the 80s in terms of total offense ranking nationally out of 130 FBS teams. They were in the 20s in his first season there. They were number one in his second season. So I do think you will see a jump in terms of how Notre Dame performs against really good competition. As you mentioned, he's dependent on the personnel, you know, it's if Joe Alt and Blake Fisher said, you know what, we changed our minds. We were just kidding about the uh, opting out. We're coming back. Then I think that changes the um, changes the calculus here. But I do think that we'll feel uh, a lot of Mike Denbrock is Brock's influences in the first year. Um, and then the other question I have is Tyler, how might the, Offense looked different than it did under Mike Denbrock in 2024 than it did with Jared Parker in 2023. Obviously, there's a different kind of quarterback running the show, but maybe overall beyond that and including that. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I feel confident in is that the offense next season will be better tailored to – to the quarterback than the 2022 offense was tailored to Sam Hartman. Um, I think that um, the offense was probably going to look a little bit different regardless of who the coordinator was because of Riley Leonard at quarterback. Um, But I just feel like the, the Hartman and 2023 offense felt a little bit too much like a forced marriage at, at times. And I, I don't know that – I don't think it'll feel as clunky as it did um, in those situations this coming season with Denbrock coming in to working around Riley Leonard. Um, he certainly has experience with a, a dual-threat quarterback and a quarterback that can run, um, and I think will sort of try to stress some deep, deep shots in the offense. So that those are the biggest things that I would expect to see in terms of uh, changes in the offense. How about you, Eric? Yeah, I think that – Mike is going to have more answers when teams try to put him into check and checkmate. When when mm-hmm. they say, okay, we're going to drop eight and rush three, he's going to have an answer for that. If they put eight in the box or nine in the box and say, beat us with your quarterback's arm, he's going to have answers both in the passing game and in the quarterback running game. And And I think that's where it'll show up. That's my memory of Mike Denbrock from what I've seen him in big games. And one of those big games was the Notre Dame Cincinnati game in Brian Kelly's final season where Cincinnati came into Notre Dame stadium and beat the Irish. And, you know, Marcus Freeman was going against Mike Denbrock in that game. And Mike Denbrock, I think got the better, I think of all four coordinators in that game, Mike Denbrock had the best day. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that that would definitely be fair, and I think he's just done so much as a college football coach. Um, right. Like I said earlier, like he he's seen a lot of different things, um, so his ability to adjust on the fly um, and mid season should be um, 
towards the high end of what you're going to see from an offensive coordinator. Okay. Do we want to hit the questions first or go to our, some Sun Bowl notes? Um, let's go to questions first. I, I imagine okay. some of those questions will overlap with some of the notes we have. Okay. Um, let's go with Frank Sarah first. Is Denbrock with the team in Texas? He is not yet. I had this in the notebook I just posted a little bit ago. According to a source, Marcus Freeman is flying uh, Mike Denbrock in. Now, he hasn't been officially named yet. He's flying him in to El Paso tomorrow. He's going to watch Notre Dame's practice tomorrow. I have supper with the uh, coaching staff and talk some things over with them. And then Thursday morning, he will meet with the team and address the team. And then he will fly back to Baton Rouge. So he won't stay for the bowl game, but he will, this will be kind of his first introduction. And then eventually we'll see him introduced as officially with a graphic and uh, a press release as the offensive coordinator. Yeah. And he's not partaking in LSU's pull bull prep. I don't know if everyone is aware of that. So um, that gives him the freedom to sort of be available to sort of get get in and around Notre Dame to to be familiar with what he's inheriting and um, be ready to to go um, after the bowl game and, and, and get get on campus and, and get things rolling in January. All right, next question is from William Bentley. Vegas has us as a six to six and a half point favorite. With your knowledge about both teams, how do you and Eric handicap the bowl game? You know, in watching the bowl games that have preceded the sun bowl <laughs> Vegas has been way off on some of them. And I think it, it's not just the opt outs. It's how bad does that team want to be there? Are they missing pieces of their coaching staff? Right. Um, you know, or, or is there a pop tart to eat at the end of the game? Um, so what I think with this game is I think the guys, for both sides that are playing in this game are pretty motivated. I think Oregon State has a tougher time because their even their new head coach who had been on their staff, Trent Bray, isn't going to coach in the bowl game, hasn't been preparing them for the bowl game. He's been working on recruiting and getting his coaching staff together. So Kefensa Henson has been the interim head coach. He's their wide receivers coach. I'm sure he'll do a great job. But they've not been a full staff for most of this bowl season. They've been missing pieces. And I think – so I'm going to handicap it w with factoring that in and factoring that Notre Dame, the guys that are at Notre Dame, and that it'll be a pro-Notre Dame crowd, <laughs> they're going to be into being in El Paso for a few days. So I'm. I think that six and a half – point sounds about right to me yeah i would tend to agree I, I don't think you can make notre dame much more of a favor than that just because of all the turnover it has i think in general you would believe that notre dame is a deeper team than oregon state um and just the oregon state situation is i mean there's not i don't what else would you compare it to where they're like basically becoming a non power five team next year. Like it's, it's just, it's a, such a strange scenario where, where the program is heading because of, because of conference realignment. Um, like it, maybe if Jonathan Smith was sticking around and they're like, you know what, we're going to rally and we're going to, we're going to prove we can do this as a, as a team that was left behind next year, but that's not what the way things have played out this, this po since the end of the regular season. So it's just like, I, I don't really know. I mean, I can certainly see that the, the folks that are left behind at Oregon State are like, they have, they're they going to have a chip on their shoulder. Um, but I don't know that that's enough to um, be considered a favorite against Notre Dame in the Sun Bowl. So, uh, like you said, the, the home I, the home crowd advantage uh, that Notre Dame may have sh should be of some importance. Um, and I just think that, that Notre Dame is deeper there. So I would I would agree. I think the line is, is about right. I, I wouldn't want to argue um, – to change it in any significant way both of them i mean notably both of them have a bunch of new starters on the offensive line and lost really good offensive linemen i mean each of them lost a first team all-american and they each lost a thousand yard rusher and each of them lost their starting quarterback um 
Oregon State lost their number two quarterback, although Ben Goldbertson has Goldbertson has to be the most experienced number three quarterback I've ever heard of, uh, with eight <laughs> starts in his career and seven right. wins. Um, and and the I think the biggest problem that Oregon State will pose is they still have their defensive line, and they were a really good run defense all year, so they are going to put Notre Dame in position where Steve Angeli is going to have to throw the ball some downfield uh, to have some so that's not looking like an Iowa game and Notre Dame wins like seven to five. All right. Uh, Frank Sarah asks, will ND be able to run the ball against Ohio or Ohio state, Oregon state? Well, again, if these teams were at full strength, this would be a real challenge because Oregon state was 15th in the country and run defense, which is the best of anybody on Notre Dame's schedule. Um, and they did it against some pretty good offenses. I mean, they accumulated mm-hmm. that against some very good offenses. Uh, they're missing some key pieces in their defense as well. Not as many total opt-outs and uh, transfers and so forth as Notre Dame, but still a good chunk of them. I think Notre Dame will be able to run the ball against Oregon State, but I don't think it's going to be crazy. I mean, I don't think they're going to, trample them and get like 200 yards but Notre Dame's backup running backs played all year and played well Mm -hmm. and uh, I think Steve Angeli will be able to with the receivers he does have I think he'll be able to mix it up a little bit and I have confidence in Gino Gadouli calling this game yeah I I think running the ball is going to be a very high priority for Notre Dame. I don't think Notre Dame's going to come out and want to try to throw it all over the field with Steve Angeli. Um, And with new all offensive linemen work again, generally it's easier to establish your, establish yourself as a run blocker than it is a pass blocker. And obviously Tosh Baker is a veteran player at right tackle. um, Doesn't have as much experience as someone that for for that um, amount of years in college football, but I think I think and just naturally I think he's a better pat, run blocker than pass blocker. Um, I think Charles Jagasaw is probably the same. Um, so I, I would like to think that even though there are some n- new pieces there, that they're going to be able to run the ball well um, and, and take some pressure off Steve Angeli. And I think it'll be an offense based off of running it well um, and, and complementing that with maybe some play action passes um, to to get uh, Steve Angeli some some optimal looks against uh, Oregon State secondary. All right. Uh, Jim Frank asks, easy one, who is starting quarterback for Notre Dame in the 2026 season? <laughs> 2026. I'll let you go first on that one. I have to do the calculus. I mean, I think C.J. Carr, right? I mean, uh, it's either C.J. Carr or Deuce Knight, I think would be your 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 best guesses. Um, but – I, I think, I mean, I think there's a good chance CJ Carr is the starter in 2025. Um, so, um, therefore, I would think 2026. He's not, he's not going to be a one-year starter and out of here um, as a sophomore. Uh, so that that would be my guess. Um, I don't know that there's much more to add. I think he's talented enough to do that. Um, and when you're looking so far out, yeah, I think he's just sort of lean lean on the talent rather than anything else. Yeah, I would I would give CJ Carr the nod. I think Kenny Minchie is a interesting uh factor in that if he's still at Notre Dame at that point, uh just because of his skill set and I again missing so much of his uh senior year. I was talking to somebody that lives in Nashville that saw him in practices and in games and really likes where his game might go. So he may Mm -hmm. be a little bit underrated, but boy, what a nice conversation for Notre Dame to have to be picking amongst those three quarterbacks of that caliber. So I'll, I'll cheat off of Tyler's paper and say (laughs) CJ Carr. All right. Michael chimes in any chance we get another 2025 commit between now and the new year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Also um, wanted to know Denbrock's history as a recruiter. Okay, I'll handle the recruiter part, and you can handle the recruit part. Got it. Um, He has a really good history as a recruiter. I would say more than 
more solid than spectacular, but in really difficult places to pull out recruits. Back when Notre Dame did it more with territories rather than positions, right? he was really good at pulling kids out of California, um, top recruits out of California. He was very good on the West Coast. He also has connections all over the place, like Chase Claypool ending up at Notre Dame was all Den Brock. He right. had a friend in Canada that told him about this kid in uh, British Columbia and uh, said, you need to take a look at, at this kid. Sent him actually basketball footage first. And then Mike went up there and took a look at Chase. And that kind of led to Chase end up being at Notre Dame. So, yeah, he's a really good recruiter. And I think the one thing that you'll see that maybe was – more similar to how Chip Long did things than Tommy Reese and Jared Parker is that he's going to have an influence on recruits beyond his position, which is tight ends. He's going to mm-hmm. really be involved with trying to get the quarterbacks and the offensive linemen. He's going to jump in on that conversation. That's what I envision Mike Denbrock as a recruiter. Yeah, and I think I think that's important – with his experience, again, I, mean, I keep talking about his experience, but I don't think that can be overstated. Um, his familiarity with Notre Dame, too. Like, he he knows what it takes to get guys into Notre Dame. Now, maybe that has changed since the last time he was here in small ways here or there. Um, but I think he probably has a good sense of, okay, this is a Notre Dame kid. I can get this kid into Notre Dame. This kid sees the value in Notre Dame, so let's continue to make progress and push forward for that recruit. Um, so I think those are some of the important things um, from his past as a recruiter that will be important. As for getting a new 2025 commit between now and the new year, I don't think that's likely the last I heard. Now maybe th- maybe some kid uh, changed his mind over Christmas and ha- had an epiphany and was like, you know what, it's time to commit to Notre Dame. I, but uh, last I checked, um, and we'll get back in the swing of things here now after the holiday, I, I haven't heard of anything. Um, in the works with, with Notre Dame getting a potential commitment between now and the start of 2024. All right. Um, William Bentley asked another one. Do you record the game at home and watch it again when you return? I record all the games and rarely watch them again. If there's something <laughs> that I really want to see that I had a question about, I'll go back and look. Um, so I've got everything DVR for like the last two seasons, but, It's rare. I did watch a little bit of the 2010 Sun Bowl recently (laughs) for kicks and giggles, but Tyler is the film scholar, so I'll let him give his answer. Yeah, I I always rewatch the game. There's certainly parts that I'll rewatch more than others. I I don't just like sit down and rewatch the whole thing Um, because, I mean, I don't need to watch a kickoff more than once necessarily. Um, So I'll pick my spots and maybe if the defense played really well and I'm not necessarily planning to write about the defense, I'll just sort of skim through some of the bigger moments of the game on defense to watch that. Um, Usually my film analysis have been more offense-based this past season um, uh, that sort of gets dictated by what the sort of hot topic around around the the game or the team is. So – uh, but I definitely spend a lot of time rewatching the game and uh, I'll always record it. And thankfully um, Xfinity has been smart enough to learn how to like, if the game goes to overtime, keep recording the game and stuff. Uh, the FUBU one was the one that's like, man, I, I got to hurry up and rewatch this game before my trial runs out because that was the thing I was worried about. The f- trial ended up being shorter than I thought it was originally. Um, I think it was like had long been advertised as a seven day free trial and it turned out to only be a four day free trial. So I was like, well, it's a good thing I waited till Friday to just subscribe uh, and, and sign up. So, but yes, I always, I always want rewatch the game. I don't necessarily like rewatch it with the sound on always. Um, Cause I know people will ask questions about the broadcast booth and I don't always have a lot of opinions because I'm not tuning in and, and listening to them. If there's like replays that they're going over um, then sometimes I'll see like, what did, what did Jason Garrett have to say about this player? Or something like that. Well, you can come over and watch it at my house because I have it on my DVR. I have the Pac-12 network in my Dish Network package. All right. Um, Jeffrey but Stevens. Bring at, snacks. Okay, I will bring snacks in exchange for the DVR access. Um, Jeffrey Stevens asks, "When would you expect Xavier Watts to make a decision on returning to Notre Dame?" 
if he hasn't made it in his mind already, um, I think shortly after the bowl game, and maybe he has, and maybe he'll announce at the bowl game or after the bowl game what he's going to do. He has until, I don't have the date right in front of me, but I, it's like the middle of January when he has to submit his name as a quote-unquote underclassman, even though he's a senior, he has eligibility left. So he's got a couple of weeks to mess around with it if he wants to. My sense is that I think he's leaning toward coming back. Yeah, I would tend to agree. And if he is, I would imagine it's probably done sooner rather than later. Uh, maybe wait till after the bowl game and then then make an announcement. Um, but uh, I think I think the longer he waits, I think that would be would tend get, have me tend to believe that he's seriously considering leaving. Um, so I think the sooner the better from Notre Dame's point of view, um, uh, because that that could likely lead to good news for the Irish. Um. Mike DeVoy asks, who's the short yardage back for the bowl game with Audric gone and no Mitchapalooza? The third down guy most of the year has been Jabron Payne. I, and third and one, fourth and one, third and medium. Right. And so I think it'll continue to be Jabron Payne. Yeah, I think so as well. That's something he's specialized in, and I would be surprised if that will change. Um, Ray John asked a question that I think we talked a, little, a bit about already. Um, but we can revisit. Uh, I think bringing a young O line together is the key for next year. If they gel, this will be a really good team. What are your thoughts? The better the offensive line is, the better the team is going to be next year. I think. Yeah. Go, I mean, as you look at them, that's going into spring. I would think, off the top of my head, that's the biggest question mark because even Riley Leonard being new. Mm -hmm. we saw him when he was healthy all through 2022 and we've seen what Mike Denbrock can do with dual threat quarterbacks and offenses. I, I think the offensive line is really where the question marks and sometimes those question marks turn out better than you think. Um, there's certainly some interesting material there, but there's a lot of work to getting them cohesive. And there's also needs to be some competition for some positions. So mm -hmm. It's going to be a busy spring for that position group. The other thing, again, is I like Mike Denbrock's background as a former offensive mm -hmm. line coach at points in his career. Yeah, that's definitely a value. Um, and making sure him and Joe Rudolph get on the same page it will be incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, I do think that will be one of the keys to to making sure that Notre Dame can maximize its 2024 season is, is getting that offensive line together. Um, and, and figuring out who the right guys are to play and then making sure that they're developing together and getting on the uh, that development that allows them to sort of see through one set of eyes, that, that sort of cliche that we use a lot um, when talking about offensive line play. I'm going to tell tell Mike Golick Jr. you said that that was a cliche. He's the <laughs> one that said it first. <laughs> well, I promise you he didn't make that one up. He, he, he heard it from plenty of other <laughs> offensive line coaches. <laughs> he said it on our shows first. Uh, all right, let's go to the Brendan McCarthy portion of the questions. Uh, Brendan says, Tom Krug, Pat Dillingham, Gary Godsey, or Steve Angeli, pick one. And I'm going to abstain because all those guys are before my time other than Steve Angeli. <laughs> I love Gary Gotze just because I love Gary Gotze, the person, and he did come on our podcast, yep. and he beat Drew Brees head-to-head. -head. Um, I I would say it goes between – Pat Dillingham's out of that. It would be Krug or Angeli. I know what Krug can do. You know what? I would pick Krug over Angeli. Angeli would be two, Gotze three, Dillingham four. All right, and the other question Brennan had is not related to football at all. Uh, it, Italians in my part of America traditionally eat seafood for Christmas Eve. I opted for standing rib roast with potatoes. Thoughts, what did you guys eat for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day? Okay, so I'm half Italian, and I am not a big seafood lover, which my grandparents and mom knew, the Italians in the family. So what we have on Christmas Eve, uh, we had steak uh, on Christmas Eve. My brother-in-law and I did. Everybody else had salmon. And 
Then on Christmas Day, we had lasagna and stuffed shells and garlic bread with cheese and all kinds of Italian stuff on Christmas night. That sounds delicious. It was. <laughs> uh, on Christmas Eve. It was back to reality today. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't whipping that up today after you finished your notebook, huh? Uh, um, for me, I went back home to my to, to be with my parents um, and, my, and my brothers um, and my brother's wife and uh, my girlfriend. And we didn't do – we don't do a meal – for Christmas Eve, like any sort of fancy meal, we just do like appetizers throughout like the whole afternoon and evening. Um, so all kinds of dips and charcuterie boards that you can imagine we have, we have that for Christmas Eve. Um, and then on Christmas day, um, it, it, it's the nice meal. Prime rib was our, was our dinner for, um, Christmas day. So that was a really nice meal with potatoes and we had some cauliflower and some corn. So, um, a, a really, uh, delicious meal, um, provided by my parents so i'm happy to have spent some time with them and eat the great food and it sounds like brennan had a very nice meal as well yes it, it, yes exactly standing uh, or sitting rib roast would be delicious <laughs> uh i prefer to eat my rib roast while sitting yeah, but yeah, if yeah. you want to eat it while you're standing that's fine <laughs> um td4 nd asks, hey guys do you think the offense will be more 11 or 12 personnel I would say I would say they're not going to use 12 as much just because they don't have as many tight ends to use. Um, they're really <laughs> no, down to not three. Through. Not like they're loaded with receivers either, Eric. <laughs> that, that's true. I think um, – I don't know. I, I just think that – I mean, it really sounds like Jaden Thomas is ready to go. Yeah. And I think that's going to make a difference. That would make a difference for me. I think you feel really good about the slot receivers where it's interesting is how Jaden Greathouse projects as that outside receiver on the field side um, and what kind of damage he can do. But I still think we're going to see them mix it up. Yeah, I think we'll see plenty of both, but I do think it'll probably be slightly more 11 than 12. Um, although I do think running the football will be of importance, but I do think that Jaden Thomas it, it, it sort of can almost make it feel like a 12 offense at, at times with the way he yeah. can block. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, we'll probably see a lot of both. Um, but yeah, the 11... Um, probably more often than not. I think that that also keeps the defense or prevents can prevent the defense from loading the box, um, which could be something that the defense may want to do because they're like, Hey, if Steve Angeli is going to beat us, let's see if he can beat us. Um, so you can at least keep the defense more honest with the three wide receivers on the field. All right. I think that covers the question portion that we have so far. We can continue people. Uh, please feel free to continue uh, asking questions, but Eric, let's go ahead and talk about some of the, Sun Bowl stuff we wanted to discuss. Okay. Some of the things I had in the notebook, and we alluded to it, you know, right. there was a battle going on on the right side at right tackle between Emil Wagner and Tosh Baker. From what Gino Goduli said uh, in El Paso today at the mini press conference, that it's going to be Tosh Baker starting at right tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, we defined a little bit more what's going to go on with uh, Jack Kaiser that when Notre Dame plays its quote-unquote base 43 defense, he'll be the rover. When they take a, a linebacker off the field, he'll move inside and be with J.D. Bertrand with the two linebackers, with um, with um, Jalen Sneed either coming off the field or lining up as a pass rusher, but he won't be you know an inside linebacker on those plays. Mm -hmm. um, they talked about nickel options that it's what we predicted Clarence Lewis, but then Christian Gray and Micah Bell also took some reps there. So those are the people that we might see there. I think that's the big, biggest stuff to come out of. Oh, and Josh Burnham being on the strong side defensive end, Al Golden was asked, you know, is that his future? Is, is that where he's going to end up? Because Notre Dame does have a lot more Vipers than it has. Right. field ends at least proven ones at this time and he said you know what i think he'd go either either way um he thinks that he's going to put on 
more weight naturally and be around 255 next year and that he's going to have the strength to do what it takes to play either side. So those were kind of the notes. And then we'll toss around some um, topics here. The first yeah, one- well, here, I wanted to mention this one too, that Terry Tyler mentioned. Um, and it gets to um, something that I observed when we were at practice last week is that um, K.K. Smith has been working out of the slot um, behind Jordan Faison. And, and so um, the depth chart uh, supported that that came out this week. Um, with those two as the slot guys, and then Jane Greathouse and Matt Salerno as the field receivers. I'm sure they'll be mixing and matching beyond just that, but that's at least how they're um, lining them up um, for the most part and getting those guys the most work, um, especially when they're so so thin at, at receiver. I think you're basically looking at six receivers total that are probably going to play most of the time during the game. I should mention Oregon State's running back Damian Martinez, who had been initially suspended for the game, then reinstated for the game, will not play in the game. They just feel like the coaching staff feels like he missed too much time conditioning and practicing being suspended. Um, And so they're going to start um, Deshaun Fenwick, who's a pretty accomplished back in his own right, didn't play as much this year. Damian Martinez was a thousand yard rusher, all pack 12. He's a sophomore. Uh, Deshaun Fenwick is a big 6'2", 222-pound redshirt senior who started his career at South Carolina, had 500 yards and five touchdowns this year, but he has over 2,000 career yards both at South Carolina and Oregon State. And and their backup is also a really big back, 6'1", 225, so they'll throw a lot of uh, at least substance at Notre Dame at running Mm -hmm. back with Martinez out. So, Tyler, I I think the biggest thing for me is how different would this game have been had you had everybody opt in, had they both teams played at full strength? Do would the matchup have been much different, both in terms of style and maybe who's the favorite here? Um, I don't think it would have been. I mean, the personnel certainly be different. I think that. I, I think Oregon State would have probably had a better chance giving given both teams at full strength. Um, I I, it would, I mean, it certainly would have been interesting to see DJ Uyunglele play against Notre Dame again. Um, I think I think Oregon State's offense. I don't know. I guess both teams' offenses might look so much different than what they were supposed to that it's it's hard to get a sense for what what we're gonna see. Um, but in terms of what we would have seen, I think it would have been two sort of defensive minded te- programs um, that it would have made for an interesting matchup. I still think it's probably what we're going to see. I don't necessarily think we're going to see a shootout, um, but I, I think it might be it could be m- more in part of like the offense is just struggling than just like the defense is being really good. Um, so I, I think when you look at that aspect of things, I think Notre Dame's defense shouldn't be too different. I think Notre Dame's defense is going to be in good shape. Um, but the, the Notre Dame's offense is, is, is barely going to resemble the one that started the season. So I think it would have been, it, there, there certainly would have been more attention and more people talking about it. Like this is a, one of the few top 20 games outside of the playoff um, or the new Year's six bowls. Um, so, uh, but I think the numbers besides the teams don't really reflect the, the quality of teams that we're going to see. Um, on the field of Sun Bowl. What about you? Yeah, I would have loved to seen this game at full strength. I'm still going to love to see it the way it is because mm-hmm. I do think you can learn a lot about next year's team, not in terms of cohesive pieces, but but separate pieces. You know, you'll say, wow, this is what my impressions of Charles Jagaza. You know, you're not getting conclusions, but you're getting impressions that I think will be interesting to take into next year. Right. And that's what I've been enjoying really about all the bowl games, although I don't know a lot of the teams as well, unless they're going to be on Notre Dame's schedule next year. I'm not <laughs> paying as much attention. I have I have only so much bandwidth to, <laughs> to, to stay with, and I don't have to vote in a postseason bowl or postseason poll this year. So, um, that's what I kind of expect, but, but I am looking forward to it. And, and I think this is a good game for Notre Dame fans that have wanted to see a lot of Steve Angeli to kind of finally see that. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it's going to quit one way or another, whether it would, would have been justified in him playing more, but at least they'll see what it looks like. And other teams will be able to see Steve Angeli and he'll have a decision to make, I think, uh, either before spring or after spring right. in terms of what his future is going to be at Notre Dame. Absolutely. So other than personnel, do we expect the offense to look different philosophically in the Sun Bowl with Gino Gadouli calling plays rather than Jared Parker? Um, I, I mentioned it earlier. I, if, if he wants to be a fan favorite, play action would be <laughs> – leaning on play action would be a good way to go. Um, that would be kind of funny, um, but also I think a good plan. Um I think that's something that would make sense to help Steve Angelia. Like I said, running the football, I think is going to be a high priority. Protect the ball. Like you don't have to go out and score 40 points to win this game. I don't think. Um, so I, I think we'll probably see a not, not necessarily a conservative offense, but one that's not, uh, it's not going to be like, Whoa, look at what they did over, over December to look at the, to sort of create this whole different offense for Steve Angelia. I think it's going to be probably a bit more of the same, um, but try to tailor it to what Steve Angeli does best and, and the personnel that you have available to you. Um, and probably, I mean, I think you don't, you want to do your best to like not put those tackles on an island as much as possible. Like, I think protecting those guys um, and helping protect Steve Angeli um, would probably be something that's a high priority as well. And I think play action can help with that. Do you think, do you think Gino incorporates Angeli as a runner? Not that he's a dual threat guy, but, you know, I mean, he, when he was in the blue gold game, uh, was it a couple of years ago where he ran yeah. for the? Yeah, yeah, that was two years ago. So, so he has that in his back pocket. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I think Oregon State's even backups will be a little bit better than Notre Dame's walk-ons were at the end of the blue gold game. But I do think to keep the defense honest, that I think they won't be afraid to do some of those uh, um, zone read plays or, or give give some. Give some opportunities for Steve Angeli to read a defensive end and pull it and run. I don't know that that's going to be a huge part of the offense, but every once in a while, especially if you're going to be a run heavy offense, I think it will help you from helping those backside players crashing um, to have Steve Angeli keep it. And and some of the bootleg stuff that we saw Notre Dame incorporate with Sam Hartman, I think will probably be part of the game plan for Steve Angeli too. That's another thing that can help offensive tackles is getting, getting the quarterback on the move and, and, making him a moving target so they don't so they can't just sort of pin their ears back in and rush with the same target in mind all, all the time. So last Tuesday we got a chance to see a little bit of practice and I do mean a little bit 15 <laughs> minutes basically plus the stretching period now not that we're ungrateful because there's value to that it's just not particularly telling but right. we get to see who's injured how the injured players are moving around how the returning players are moving around we got to see C.J. Carr throw the ball. So let's start with C.J. Carr, who's not playing in this game because of mm -hmm. NCAA rules, but was able to get a waiver to practice. So what do you think the value for him and the value for Notre Dame was of him having those, you know, few practices with the team before he actually – Yeah, I think just – Just getting a sense for what it's like to play college football, right? I mean, he's not – being groomed to play in this game he he was being used as a scout team quarterback as someone to give the defense a good look um but to get a sense for how things work I, he's certainly seen practices at Notre Dame before but to be able to participate be a part of the team to learn some of the terminology um that the quarterbacks are going through um and, and just kind of show what he can do I think it's just going to add a little bit extra more comfort for him um when he when it comes to January um, and then when it comes to the spring, he, he's going to feel like, yeah, this is old, old hat for me. Um, I've done this before. He can help some of the other early and early freshmen with some of the new things that he went through during this bowl prep. Um, he'll have a, a leg up on those guys. So I think it's just a, um, a really smart thing, especially for a quarterback that's you, you want to be a leader. He's, gonna, he's a leader of his class. Um, I think he, he um, probably took a lot of valuable things from that. Um, and, and Notre Dame should benefit from that. In the long run, I'm sure Notre Dame's defense was happy to have someone with C.J. Carr's ability throwing the ball against yeah. them um, and, and testing them as they prepare for this game. Yeah, Al Gold mentioned today that uh, Notre Dame's defensive coordinator, that how willing C.J. Carr was to helping the team. Hey, where can I help? What kind of looks do you need? It was interesting the little bit we did see of him. He's tall. 
you know, and Ryan Leonard's going to be tall. We're going to have two, six, four guys on campus. Right. That's a, the Tommy Reese quarterbacks are gone. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so there's some height there. And I mean, you didn't look out there and say, God, who's the high school kid. Right. Um, you know, he, he looked the part and, you know, had some zip on the ball and, you know, he fit right in as number 17. Um, and quickly, Jeffrey Stevens asked on the belt and suspenders theory, if Angel- Angelia and Minchie go out of the game, can Carr take snaps? And the answer to that is no. No. He's not He's not allowed to play. He's not even – I don't know if he's allowed to dress. My understanding was he wouldn't dress, um, yeah. so he wouldn't even have shoulder pads to go into the game. Well, later. he's not allowed to dress in football <laughs> gear anyway. <laughs> yes. He will not be <laughs> nude on the sidelines of El Paso. <laughs> So I guess it would be Dylan DeVeason would be the next guy. Yeah, in. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I think that would. I haven't uh, seen him in a while. He got demoted from his holding duties. Yeah, they, uh, maybe they would just run some wildcat or something. I don't. I don't know what would happen. That would be. That would be worst case scenario for Notre Dame for sure. And Oregon State is in the same boat. They're they're back up to their new backup to Ben Goldbrunson has a played at all Goldbertson right. only threw one pass all season so okay um do we want to do more questions or move on to signing day and transfer stuff uh let's uh la, 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 la. oh one more question mike devoy asked have you seen colsey thomas and kk in practice are they really going full speed i was noticing thomas in practice uh, when we were watching it, and I looked for KK, who looks really tiny. Yes. Um, uh, I didn't notice Colsey as much. Did you? I know he was there, but did you watch Colsey at all in our 15 uh, Yeah, minutes? yeah. I, I was looking at those guys. It looked like I didn't see any, like, wow, I'm not sure that he's going to be ready to perform. I think all those guys looked like they're on their way back to getting ready um, and have have a uh, a chance to do that. Um, so I, I think that, uh, that would, that should be helpful for Notre Dame. I, but I, yeah, I think they're running full speed. Casey K Smith's speed shouldn't be an issue for him. It was a shoulder injury injury. So I think he's been, he's been getting ready and been waiting to be cleared for a while now. So I think maybe some conditioning things would be something that he would work on, but, um, and just getting back in the natural flow of things and knocking off the rust. But I think those guys should all be full speed and, and ready to go for Notre Dame uh, on Friday. Okay, so last Wednesday was kind of a quiet national signing day. Notre Dame ended up with the number nine class in the 2024 cycle, according to Rivals, which is the group that we're affiliated with. There wasn't any drama. Why not, Tyler? Well, I I think it started at the top of the class. Like, the guys were bought in. Like, even people were worried that Kingston Villiamuas, people meaning fans more than Notre Dame, uh, were worried that Kingston Villamuasa was maybe going to flip because he was liking posts on t- social media that had to do with Ohio State. But um, there was not that flakiness within him and, and his in and the, the family's like insistence that he was coming to Notre Dame. Um, obviously, CJ Carr, he was so uh, invested that he was coming to Notre Dame for bowl practices, regardless of who his offensive coordinator was. Um, so I, I think. Uh, there's just a lot of and, and we saw wide receivers stay committed to the program even when the wide receiver coach changes. Um, so I just think there was a lot of guys at the top of the class that are the year most talented guys that were bought in. They, they built tight bonds as a class because it was so many of those guys had committed so early that they've been on campus together so many times. Um, and I think it was a reflection of their faith in Marcus Freeman, um, but also belief in what he's selling. Um, Notre Dame can do for you not just as a football player, but um, as a student and 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 beyond. So I think um, they were really did a good job of identifying fits for Notre Dame um, and getting guys to buy into for Notre Dame for what it can be. Um, and I think that that showed to be the case uh, come signing day. So Notre Dame ends up signing twenty three players from fifteen states. They signed six transfers, which is one short of the record for scholarship transfers, and there's still more, we believe, on the way. Um, who do you feel like are the best? You did everybody from 1 to 23, so who are your top guys that you'd like to highlight um, in overall impressions of the class? Yeah, so I I, I agree with Rivals uh, in thinking Kingston, Villamuasa, 
is the the best player in the class. He's a five star for a reason. I I agree with that. Um, and I guess technically I kept um, in order the the number two and three guys with Cam Williams and CJ Carr. Um, or no, I guess Gerby Lambert is ranked higher than CJ Carr in the rivals rankings. Um, I have Lambert at five. Bryce Young, I'm higher on. I put him at number four. Um, so I think they're there. I, I just really like the top ten of this class. I think is really good. Um, and maybe the best um, that I've covered in since doing this since 20, 2012. Um, Kedron Young, um, I think, is really undervalued by rivals. I think he's a really uh, talented running back that that I think he'd have a chance to to play right away. Micah Gilbert, I think, is someone that can also play right away. I really like the the potential for Logan Thomas and Es Williams is is a good running back within his in his own right. So that, I think there's just a lot of talent at the top of this class. Um, and I think that shows up in the rankings too. Like rivals agrees with us and not necessarily in who and what always, but, um, on the rival side, side of things, the class is worth 25, 51 points, which is the third best total since 20, 2006 behind just the 2008 and 2013 classes. Um, and both of those classes finished in the top three in those years. Um, so I think that goes to show how much talent is in this class. I think it also shows like, how good these top end teams are recruiting too, that there's so many more teams that are above that, that number of the, the rivals ranking uh, points. Um, so you have to really recruit at a sort of very, very high level to, to be among the best. And so number nine might not feel like, Oh, great. We're on the, we're on the way to a championship, but I think um, this is a really talented class. Um, and I think they're, they're stacking these really talented classes. Um, if Notre Dame continues to hold onto a top 10 spot, It'll be the third time in four years that Notre Dame finished in the top 10. Um, so that's a 75% clip over a four-year span. In the 15 recruiting cycles before that, um, Notre Dame finished in the top 10 only five times. So they were they were, they were getting there in a 33% clip. So a, a definite step up in the, the consistency in recruiting that Notre Dame has had so as of late as well. So a couple of post-signing notes. Will Black, an off, three-star offensive lineman in the 2025 class has committed and that is the number one class in 2025 so far mm -hmm. cornerback kevin hughes a four-star cornerback has reclassified into the 2024 class but we don't think he's probably going to end up at notre dame tyler even though they're in his finalists yeah i mean i wouldn't rule it out yet uh it seems like on the surface uh, a student reclassifying may create some hurdles for notre dame um to, to remain on track to be admitted to Notre Dame. Um, so I, I haven't been able to sort that out. I mean, he announced that on Christmas day. Um, so I, 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 I would like Notre Dame's chances a little bit less than I would have earlier. Um, he wasn't necessarily someone that I was like on the verge of putting in a future cast for, for Notre Dame. So I think I need to see how things are playing out here. Notre Dame is a place he wants to make an official visit to um, before making a decision. But I think we need to make sure that um, everything would 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 allow for Notre Dame to have room to add another guy um, in the 2024 class, and then um, that he, he can sort of still be on track to be admitted to Notre Dame as well. Okay, um, do we want to take more questions or for John? Um, I wanted to highlight this. It's not a question, but a compliment, and I, I um, it's more about you than it is about me, but. Patrick McCarthy said, congrats, men, on breaking the offensive coordinator news. Big time scoop. I always trust your reporting and wouldn't tune into anyone else for trusted news breaking. No question. Bravo. Um, I wanted to give Eric some kudos for that. He was all over the men, Mike Dembrock, um, and offensive coordinator search. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, even though Eric may not like this, uh, give him some, some praise. Um, and, and thanks to Patrick for giving me the opportunity to do that. I know, uh, I do a lot of the communicating with our folks on the insider lounge, um, maybe just because I, I I'm addicted to it. But um, uh, people were giving me credit. I was like, "Hey, Eric did most of the work here. I I did some vetting of some of the other guys that we were hearing." But um, Eric was was all over this, um, and uh, I'm proud of the work he did, and I'm glad that he's getting um, proper recognition for that as well. I appreciate that, and it was a fun story to cover, and I think will be fun going into. 2024 so um the transfers notre dame has six transfers right now mm -hmm. and we do think that they will continue to add now we should give you kind of a scholarship roster reset notre dame is at 89 
scholarship players right now in the moment. They need to be at 85, but not until the first day of classes. Normally at this time, Notre Dame is like over 100. So <laughs> there's been, you know, the guys have jumped into the portal a lot quicker this year that are leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, Tobias Merriweather is the one most recent outgoing transfer who landed. He landed at Cal. What are your thoughts real quickly, Tyler, about him ending up at Cal? Yeah, I mean, interesting. I, I, Cal hasn't been the most dynamic of offenses, so I'm interested to see how he does. Uh, we'll see if he can um, reach the potential that I think we all believe he has, but it didn't ever seem to get close to that at Notre Dame. So hopefully things work out for him. Um, for his sake, he finds what, he, what he's looking for out there. And he will have a teammate that he knows, Aiden Kiana Ina. Yeah, is uh, also going to Cal, defensive lineman from. Yeah, Cal. on I, on the transfer front, I just want to highlight um, there still is time for Notre Dame to host guys that could be mid year enrollees. There's a quiet period, which I know the recruiting calendar and terms are weird. Where a quiet periods like what that means they're doing something, but yes, January third through the seventh is a period where schools can host mid year transfer candidates. Um, so guys that are intending to enroll for the spring semester. Um, can get on campus during those times. And now it's not specific to Notre Dame. That's uh, across the country. Um, so I, I think if Notre Dame finds guys that, whether it's at receiver, offensive tackle, safety, I think those are the positions that are the most pressing positions of need that Notre Dame can still try to make things work there. And, and Notre Dame has done that in the past. That um, Notre Dame did, a, I think, better job this year in terms of getting ahead of guys and getting guys earlier than it has. Um, and so we'll see if there's there's some more additions to be made, whether it's, going into January or going into, into June. Right. And there is a spring portal period in terms of people jumping in more player movement that happens mid April to late April. And if Notre Dame had some unexpected departures or they got a position group that was hit, especially hard with that, right. then they have a chance to recoup those and get their roster back up to, how they want. What did you think of um, Notre Dame taking both Riley Leonard and Bo Collins, guys that didn't profile as the typical transfers from a standpoint of they're not grad transfers and they're not freshmen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think certainly that's something that Notre Dame needs to be able to do if it wants to have a wider pool of candidates it can take. I still don't know, and I, I wonder I, – I'm interested to see how, like how guarded they are about talking about this is like, are these guys going to get Notre Dame degrees or are these guys going to end up taking one more semester back at Duke and Clemson and just getting degrees from their previous schools? Um, that doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm not like, Hey, if you're a student at Notre Dame, you needed to get a degree. Like I want guys to get college degrees, but like, it doesn't matter to me whether they're getting Notre Dame degrees or not. Now, obviously I understand the value of a Notre Dame degree and, and people have, differing opinions on whether or not you should be able to get a, a degree um, if you're that late of a transfer into Notre Dame. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's an understanding that those guys are good students. Um, Riley Leonard, I don't know that was ever a recruit that Notre Dame looked at. Bo Collins was someone that Notre Dame looked at very closely early on in the process before he ended up at Clemson. So um, I know those guys were on track to eventually graduate soon um, from their, their respective schools, but um, getting them into Notre Dame and, allowing them to to continue their 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 college ball careers for one last season, I think is a good opportunity for Notre Dame. And hopefully those guys get out of it what they need as well. One thing that I don't think will affect Notre Dame as much, but will affect a lot of other teams, is there was a lawsuit that kind of opened the door for people to transfer in only the winter in the spring sports more than one time as underclassmen without having to sit out. Previously, the rule was you had to sit out if it was your second transfer unless you were a grad transfer. The NCAA thought, you know what, we've lost a lot in court. We're going to extend that to football players that will be going somewhere next fall. Now, that doesn't really affect Notre Dame that much because they don't have a lot of guys transferring in that aren't already graduate transfers right. or won't be. The two guys who it will affect are Drew Pine and Tyler Buckner. Those guys, if they fall short of graduating 
either in the spring or the summer, they can transfer now without penalty Mm -hmm. and resume their football career somewhere else. As of now, Tyler Buckner confirmed that he's coming to Notre Dame to play lacrosse and take classes this spring. And Drew Pine has confirmed that he's coming back to Notre Dame to take classes. But again, he could say, oops, just kidding, and go somewhere else if he really wanted to uh, play somewhere else in the spring. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, Drew Pine always was a big Notre Dame fan, and I, I think he sees the value. Both those guys do in the Notre Dame degree. Um, so I think that's kind of cool, and I think would should be a selling point for Marcus for you moving forward. Like, hey, we had guys that transferred out but came back to Notre Dame to get their Notre Dame degrees, um, and, and I think that um, is a really good look for Notre Dame. Um, certainly, I mean, Tyler Buckner and Drew Pine would probably have hoped to have, like, had great seasons and maybe not be in a position to consider doing this quite yet. Maybe they'd come back to Notre Dame later in life to, to get their degrees. But um, the situation has played out that, that this makes the most sense for them. And I applaud them for, for coming back to take care of that. Okay. Do we need to do a lightning round? Do we need to settle any fights over here in the comments? <laughs> no, I don't, we don't have to. I appreciate the the heated debate Roosevelt, Carney and Ray John were having, but um, no, I don't, I don't think that there's anything that we need to settle I'm going back and and scrolling to see if there's any questions that um, stood out to me that we missed, but I think that covers just about anything. Um, if anyone's saying anything while I'm scrolling, um, I think I think we're good. So go ahead and start us closing out here, Eric. Okay, I want to thank Legacy Heating and Air as usual, and we've had some crazy weather here, and we're mm. equipped for all of it because. Uh, of legacy, at least at my house. I don't know about Tyler's parents. They live in the port. Um, but at my house, we do. Um, next week, Tyler, we are going to do the show on Monday night or Tuesday night. Um, I think we or can do it Monday. Not decided. I don't know that we've decided to be honest. Let us know if I mean, we had a really good big audience tonight, so I don't know. Uh, maybe Tuesday night should be uh, something I, I think we need to still figure that out. So maybe. Um, that's a bad job by us by not having this figured out by the time we ended our show. But uh, we'll keep people posted um, on what makes the most sense. Uh, it, it could be something where it's it, it's based on whatever news may be happening. If it, if it makes sense to do on a Monday or a Tuesday, um, Monday uh, Monday night is the playoff game, so maybe that would be a bad time to do it, right? Like Monday night is the college football playoff games, right? It, one of them, I think, is at night, and one of them's in the late afternoon. The Rose yeah. Bowl, and the so it probably Bowl. makes more sense to do it Tuesday. Okay, let's um, do it about, Tuesday. Thinking out loud, we're thinking out loud, <laughs> and if any of you voted, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, that's going to do it for me. Other than we do have a thirty-day free trial that Tyler will tell you about, and then I'm going to shut up and let him finish. Yeah, use the promo code NDYT. It's an exclusive code for our YouTube audience, uh, and you can get a thirty-day free trial when you sign up. Um, at InsideNDSports.com. That gives you free access to our premium analysis and recruiting coverage, transfer portal coverage, special access to us over on the Insider Lounge. Um, that's where we report our news and what we're hearing first. Um, and that would have kept you in the loop on what was going on with Notre Dame's offensive coordinator search. Um, I don't know if we'll have another coaching search uh, by, uh, by the start of next year. I would think if you're betting, I would say there probably are. Just the odds seem to go that way. But we'll see what happens there and we'll see what – where we what information we can report if that's if that's something that happened. Um, like I said at the top of the show, like, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for reminders just in case we change our mind on record, doing the show on Tuesday night next week. Um, but we appreciate the uh, the sizable live audience we had tonight. Hope everyone had a great Christmas and has a happy new year.